Um, is everybody able to see uh, my presentation? Yes, Does sir. Does it look okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. Great. Well, thank you, um, everyone. Um, I'm excited to be here. Um, thank you on behalf of uh, APCO for letting us present. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about a pretty, um, a very relevant subject um, that pertains to the new Wi-Fi 6C initiative. Um, so, um, I'm going to go over basically a little bit on the initiative, talk a little bit about the background, and then talk about a solution that we've developed um, to help our customers in this space. So. Um, the topic of the conversation today is our frequency assurance system. Um, it's basically a software expert system that helps give our customers visibility and awareness of their network relative to interference um, in, uh, in the network. So I'm going to start with just a quick overview and background. Um, so Wi-Fi 6E is now officially a thing. Um, the FCC back in April basically made this into uh, law and basically opened up the six gig band, opening up the, the spectrum for unlicensed devices. So I'll talk a little bit more about the category of devices, the types of uh, devices. Um, but what we've heard since then is that as early as June, um, a lot of the chipset manufacturers like Broadcom had started shipping six, uh, six C chipsets. So that was the first deployment of um, this technology. And what that meant was that there would be devices that support this band uh, and the space basically available uh, pretty soon. The initial projections were um, that as early as September, we would start seeing some devices. Now we have reports of the first Wi-Fi 6E um, router coming out from ASUS. Um, it's going to be available this winter. Um, and this is when we're really expecting to start seeing a lot more uh, consumer devices, um, low power devices, and devices in general in this space um, starting to roll out. Um, next generation phones, tablets, all of these will eventually start adopting this. So the ruling itself basically opens up um, and is projecting over a billion devices to be deployed in the six gig spectrum or across the six gig band, um, which is concerning for us. So if we take a look at the actual report in order, um, what the ruling basically does is it divides the, um, the initiative into two categories. There are two types of devices that will exist in this band. One is the standard power access point or standard power device class. And the second is a low power device class. So um, in addition to the obvious uh, transmit output power EIRP um, separation and, and limit between the devices, there is a mechanism called AFC, which stands for automatic frequency control. AFC is basically the mechanism um, by which the FCC basically um, would control our LAN or unlicensed devices, the deployment and any impact to fixed service incumbents, so any existing six gig uh, users. AFC only pertains to the standard power uh, category. So you can see the 5.9 to 6.4 and 6.5 to 6.8 gig um, bands, sub bands, they are basically allocated for standard power devices and any standard power device that basically has the higher power output basically has to go through the AFC. The second category, these are the low power. This is basically like the router I showed. These are devices that are exempt from AFC. Now, these are the devices that most likely will make up the, the large volume of devices, but still you can see it, it traverses the entire band. Um, the categories in which these devices can operate are, are numerous, um, and these will go uncontrolled. So in addition to just standard noise floor impact, there are cases when this will have direct impact into licensed microwave. So obviously this is problematic. And when we actually look at each of these um, elements in, in more detail, the AFC process, um, I think it's still being defined. Last we heard over the summer, the actual regional operators were still being qualified, um, selected. The plan is to have multiple AFC operators, um, typical, typically by region. And, um, the, the AFC process itself will basically utilize the ULS database, check any site data coordinates elevation, and then once um, an RLAN entity tries to deploy a standard power device, they would basically check in with the AFC operator, they would provide the details, and then there would be a cross check and a handshake. AFC will basically give the permissible frequency um, and validate the location, and then the RLAN will be able to deploy. Um, now, what um, what this means is, and what, what the ruling says is that 
um, the RLAN entity has to check in with the AFC operator daily. They basically have to do this cross check daily in order to operate. If they don't check in or uh, if they don't check in, they have to turn their radio off or their site off, um, or they have to basically comply with any AFC provided uh, configuration. Um, right now though, very little is known about this process. Aside from us knowing who a few of the AFC operators will be, um, we don't really have too much clarity on the process, the handshakes, the mechanisms, and so on. So there's a lot of questions about this. Um, there is currently no plans uh, to consider uh, cumulative aggregation. So basically, it's an it's a individual check between the AFC and an RLAN entity. So it will be a, basically an individual check. If there are multiple RN, RLAN devices, the impact and contribution from each of the devices is not considered in the analysis. So unlike the frequency coordination process where you basically have to look at cumulative power at a site um, and, and the contribution to EIRP, this is basically looking at it individually. So it does actually lead to a lot of inconsistencies and probably inaccuracies in what, what data will be provided. Now, standard power access points, again, you do have an access point and then you will have client devices. Each will have different power levels. Um, and like I mentioned, they basically have to check in daily. They have to basically provide the information and then the AFC will basically um, validate and then give the go ahead. So this is, this is directly from the FCC report and order document. Again, there's a lot of information that hasn't been provided yet. And estimates and guesses are that um, the AFC process will basically be firmed up in the uh, first quarter of uh, calendar year 21. So after January. By then we'll have the operator selected and then there's probably a, a process to get all the in unique and individual processes aligned um, and then go from there. So the more we hear about it, the more we can share, but right now we don't have too much information. So this is problematic. Um, I know there's been a lot of debate discussion around this. Um, we hear from people um, who have mixed feelings about it, uh, assuming that there isn't going to be an issue that it might not be as bad as, as perceived. But here's what we know. Um, what we know is that the impetus for this ruling, uh, the creation of the six gig band for unlicensed was because the 5.8 gig band was just overly saturated. So unlicensed equipment that was previously op uh, operating in the 5.8 uh, 5 gig band, there was so much saturation in deployment that they just could not operate. So they petitioned with the FCC and along the way, a lot of um, very wealthy companies uh, came along and, and jumped onto it, but they basically asked for additional bandwidth. So if I remember correctly, the 5.8 gig band, you had something like 500 megahertz available uh, for devices. This now initiative gives, gives about 1200 megahertz available for devices to operate. So if we look at that original deployment of 5.8 as a baseline, we can easily um, estimate that um, that this will be the same situation. The volume is much higher, the, the spectrum is, is much um, wider, and then the impact in the space could be much more critical. So that's one data point. Secondly, if we look at what the FCC has already put together, the AFC um, process as it's defined, um, the process, the guidelines, kind of the expectations, it's got a lot of holes in it, and we're concerned that it just will not work. Right, right away, immediately, you can see that the fact that it's not considering any cumulative um, uh, interference models or looking at the effect of multiple devices at a site is a, is a major exclusion and emission that could impact operation, power levels, and so on. Um, interference analysis, which we do with the licensed microwave band, takes a lot of this into uh, consideration and there's heavy scrutiny around it. So we, we're just not sure how this is going to play. The AFC is also contingent on the existing ULS database. So any data, any coordinates that are in the FCC ULS database, if they are inaccurate, then any data that the AFC comes up with will uh, be unlikely uh, accurate as well. And we know from ex experience that the ULS database is highly inaccurate. Every time we come across a, um, a check, we can see that there are some inaccuracies, sometimes even, um, sometimes very significant. Um, and then the third and fourth bullets, there are a lot of six gig uh, links in the US. Um, and most of our public safety uh, customers, other mission critical applications, they're all run on six gigahertz. So it's the primary band for, um, it's the primary band for uh, backhaul and for high mission critical, um, highly critical traffic. 
Lower six is also the primary band for higher capacities. So you have the very high capacity trunk links basically that are traversing the country in this band. Um, so it's a concern. And then radios inherently have not been able to do anything with interference. They, they were designed to basically assume that interference doesn't exist. Part of being in the license spectrum and using part 101, having the frequency uh, interference analysis process was that you would operate without having to, to worry about interference. So there really isn't much that the radios can do natively today. So this is where we, we started looking at the FAS and, and looking at ways that we can address this issue. There's obviously a lot of blind spots that we have going into it and what we can do to help our customers in the process. So if we take a look at um, interference currently, traditionally, if there's any issue in the path, if you have a microwave link and there is a drop in RSL or there's a, a status alarm or the link goes down, you're basically um, given a set of alarms, status, um, maybe some PCR data that shows you graphically what the link looks like. And then you as, as the customer have to basically trouble well, and not analyze before you troubleshoot, but analyze what the root cause could be. And you go through the different steps. You basically look at, is it a path issue? Was it a fade issue? Is it an equipment issue? Is there some user error or something that happened? So you have a very um, manual troubleshooting process that you have to follow. If there is any interference today, by the time you figure it out, you basically are looking at alternatives. You, it's a reactive process. You're not sure what, what uh, is causing it, where it's coming from, um, and then what's the, the severity of the impact. Um, so the reactive nature of this is bad, and we're trying to address that. Secondly, there is no reporting process. Right now, we do not know what the remediation process with the FCC will look like. Most likely, it will require some type of reporting, um, some way to indicate that there is a bird uh, impact, traffic uh, issues, uh, and so on. But we, without having that clarity, we're just not sure what it is specifically. But we're confident that any type of remediation will require some type of data, some reporting baselining. What is the current network performance look like? How much interference is there currently? And then over time, what does the impact of these additional devices look like when, we, when it comes to interference? So these are, again, a couple of blind spots uh, related to this um, that we were seeking to address. One is give our customers a little bit more visibility so that it, the process is more proactive. To simplify basically the way that um, the issues are handled. And then three, have a way that we can baseline and report the issues just so later on when we do have a little bit more clarity about the remediation, we have this data collected and we can actually use it. The ruling was made um, largely because of analysis, theoretical analysis, ideal conditions, and so on. It's time that we countered that with actual data and we'll be able to get field data from, um, from this system. So what we've introduced is something called FAS. Uh, again, it stands for uh, Frequency Assurance Software. It's basically an intelligent algorithm that sits on top of our uh, monitoring system. And what it does is it collects data from the radio, not normal data, regular uh, elements like RSL, signal to noise ratio, um, bit error rate, um, metrics that the radio has often, has always collected. What we do is we apply a set of algorithms that basically then an analyzes these metrics to basically identify, one, the presence of interference, two, the type of interference, and then three, the severity of the interference. So you can kind of see in the screenshot, the green nodes represent um, no issue. They're, the paths are running clean. There's no interference. Everything is okay. The, the highlighted parts, the, blow, the parts that have been magnified, you can see out of those four nodes, three of them have interference. Green represents no issue. The yellow represents some interference, but not enough to basically cause an issue. In this case, you basically have interference that's been overcome by either the radio's adaptive modulation or FEC, where it's correcting some of the, the issues into the modem. And then the items in red represent some critical issues. This is where the link is lost, it's locked up, um, the site is down. So these are severe interference issues. So this right away will one, give you the visibility, and then two, it alleviates the process to have to troubleshoot and spend time to try to figure out what it is. Now, if, if I go back to the original example, when you're troubleshooting for um, a path issue, interference is usually right at the bottom of the list. So you rule out everything else before you say what else could remain, and then it's interference. So you're spending a lot of time trying to figure out what the root cause of it could be. This gives you real-time visibility into the network. 
Now, um, part of the reporting is uh, data on the actual network. So this kind of shows you, this shows you an example of one of the dashboards that's available. This shows you performance of the network. The pie chart basically represents the time um, in each alarm level. So we have three levels of alarms, level one, two, and three. Basically, is it uh, present but not uh, impacting? It's present and it is degrading traffic, or three, it's present and it's severe. So the colors basically represent the different uh, levels. And then you have basically the charts at the bottom that show you uh, on um, the day and time in which you had different amounts of interference. And then the blue chart, basically how many radios or inter uh, interfaces basically had that inter uh, interference. So this gives you a nice graphical way to see that you had basically um, a portion of your links affected, all of your links affected, um, how many of your links affected, and then to what level. Were they severe? Were they um, minor? What's the situation? So this is part of the reporting that we will offer is that you'll be able to track this and be able to baseline on day zero before the, um, the ruling or day one on the first day. And then basically over time, be it a month, every week, six months, it could be your baseline reporting. So that if you do see some issues down the road, then the onus of correction is not on you. You're basically able to pass it on to the AFC, RLAN, and possibly the, the FCC. So this is, this is um, just a graphical view. It's just to kind of show you what, um, what we can do with the FAS system. And this is basically in addition to this screenshot or view where you're basically getting real-time updates. So in terms of benefits of the FAS, one is that it gives you visibility of the network. You have now the awareness and it's proactive. So now you're basically able to understand how your network is performing. And it's not just about knowing when your link is down. The awareness of the level one and two uh, issues basically give you uh, awareness of a potential interference uh, element that could be present and causing issues before it becomes detrimental. So if there's a path with the site issue, um, you could then start doing some of the remediation, be it with external parties, doing internal research and so on. It just, again, addresses that blind spot that we currently have. So that visibility will help. Um, the data will be useful once we get into remediation and this data will be achievable without having to spend hours and hours of trying to correlate uh, data on your own. So it will save you time, money, um, and labor costs basically in having to do it alternatively. Alternatively, and I'll show you um, this when we get to the lab part of it, is you need to be expecting interference and with a spectrum analyzer at the site and be able to measure basically any outside signals that are not part of your wanted signal. Um, or you take my other alternative, which is you do the root cause analysis and try to rule out everything else. Um, and then the third item, because this is an application on our ProVision Plus element management system, you can have this visibility anywhere. This is a web-based um, uh, system, so you can basically be um, on your phone, on a tablet, be able to access the data anywhere, as long as you have a connection. So this is also, it's a system. So right now we've released this initial um, system with basically the awareness and reporting uh, and some of these capabilities. We also have a, a very extensive roadmap tied to this to be able to do additional functionality. So this is step one in, in this direction that we're trying to get out into the market to give our customers some um, uh, systems, tools, ability to basically counter some of these issues. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through some of the testing that we've done. So I wanted to start with, um, I'll talk about the algorithm, talk about the lab testing, and then we'll go into the field testing. So I mentioned this a little bit before, is that um, in terms of interference scenarios, you have um, a couple of different common scenarios. Um, the first two are the more obvious ones. These are the more apparent interference scenarios um, where you basically have significant interference that is causing either a link to go down or causing some sig uh, significant errors. These are now elements that are typically picked up by your network management system. You would see a link down or a link lock or a, a large spike in, in uh, bit error rate and uh, errors on the path. So these are, um, these are scenarios that would be visible. You would know when this occurs. So there is already a mechanism, although it's not that clear, but you would know when your, your radio is, is at, uh, in trouble. FAS will detect that, obviously. The next two are basically issues that are kind of uh, in cloak mode. They kind of fly under the radar. There's interference um, accumulating on the radio. 
there's definitely some performance affecting uh, variables attached to it, but it's something that you normally would not pick up. Your network management system would not show an alarm state or oftentimes an L, like a, a status like change. Um, the radio inherently has some mechanisms to counter degradation of signal, regardless of what the root cause is. So in this case, if the interference is enough to start impacting the signal to noise ratio and bit error rate, your radio might kick in with FEC to basically increase the threshold, clean up the signal, and you're basically running um, over the air. Or if you have adaptive coding modulation, then it might jump um, modulation states just to again, increase the fade margin and get over it. So in this case, you might see a status change. Uh, in some cases, like in the uh, uh, FEC case, you might not know what's happening. FEC there is there for a reason, um, of course. So by utilizing the FEC band or margin for correcting interference, now that FEC is unavailable for any real um, issues, in case there is a fade, um, in case there is a fade that causes outage where FEC could have countered that, you've basically lost that margin. So here's an example of where an outage can be caused because of uh, interference, but not directly correlated to it. It's just a, it's a step-by-step -step process in that sense. So the system itself will give you different levels of visibility, and then also visibility to the more obvious interference scenarios, as well as the ones that you may not uh, easily be able to identify. And then of course, the negligible interference or no impact. That will be like I showed earlier, the green, uh, the green nodes, basically, where there is nothing, performance is fine, and, and there's no issue. And the way we actually figure out um, the presence of interference, is by, again, taking um, the, the radio metrics, radio data that we're collecting, and then basically running it through some um, intelligent algorithms. So we're basically collecting radio data, we're grabbing them from radio um, management bins, and then basically checking for different levels. We're checking RSL, is it faded or not? Then we check for link alarms, we check for errors, and then we check for um, signal to noise ratio uh, degradation, and then check if FECs come, uh, come up. So it's basically, if you look at it, this is basically the flow chart of how you would manually troubleshoot um, the link. Is if you had, uh, if you were using a network management system and you saw uh, a site go red, then you would basically go through these same steps and start checking, okay, well, what was my RSL? Did I have any link alarms? Was it hardware or not? Um, were there any errors? What was the SNR? So think of every one of these steps as time that somebody would physically have to spend trying to correlate the data. Now, the, the cool thing is these checks are happening in real time. So every couple of seconds or every second, you're probably, the, the, the system itself is going through all these checks. So these algorithms basically, instead of doing manual hourly uh, analysis by hand, we're basically doing it instantaneously um, using algorithms. And that's just the first tier. We call it the first order. Then once we have identified that, okay, there is something happening uh, when we get to this point, basically, if there's if we go through these checks and nothing's happened, um, there could have been a, a, a bird flying by, some clouds that flew by and or passed by and it caused an issue, but everything is okay. But if we do come up with, with a, um, an indicator that there is interference, then we go from first order to second order and we start doing a deeper dive. And then this is where we start looking at um, in more detail, what's the root cause? Is it interference? Yes, most likely. What type? Is it bursty? What is it? Um, and so this is where we get into the additional um, algorithms in detail. And then underneath that, there's also a third order where we basically start looking at um, the type of discrimination. Is it multipath, symmetry, bursty? What, what is the type of interference? So this gives you now a little bit more visibility of the network performance and what the root cause could be. So again, I mean, th these are all checks that you would manually have to spend time understanding. Um, the software itself, it's intelligent. It basically does um, correlate all this data for you. And it, we call it an expert system because we're, we're constantly looking at additional benefits, additional elements. What else can we add to the algorithm? What other data is there available that we can actually utilize? Um, and as more customers start using it and they give us feedback, then we can basically go back in and start uh, improving this system as well. So it is a very intelligent tool. Now, in terms of the test results, I'm gonna start with the lab setup. Um, firstly, what we did with, in the lab was try to create uh, an environment and see what, uh, how we would measure interference. So we have these, uh, these radios, it represents one link. We have basically the path connected to 
this variable attenuator. This attenuator represents the path condition. So this is where we'll do the fading and, and so on, control the RSL. Then we have this coupler basically that introduces this unlicensed radio into, this, into the path. Now we're using 5.8 gig because there were no six gig uh, uh, Wi-Fi devices available at the time, but this is a 5.8 gig microwave radio and this is a 5.8 gig um, base station. So one, we wanted to measure impact of direct interference and then also see how we would, how we would recognize it otherwise. So we have this, this unlicensed radio uh, fed into the path. There is the second attenuator that we basically will control, uh, use to control the flow of interference into the path. So if we have, we'll set this attenuator to maximum initially so that there's um, almost zero interference. This signal is completely basically blocked out, filtered out. And then I will change that, that attenuator, reduce it so that um, more and more of the signal flows into the path. And then we'll see the spectrum analyzer curve associated with that. So if we start with, um, this is the interferer signal. So you can see the amplitude. Um, one is um, the interferer alone with payload and then max hold without the, the payload. So it's got a significant amplitude um, to it. So, and this is just kind of a snapshot of what, um, what it looks like without any attenuation on the path. So if we introduce the signal onto the path, so right now that interferer attenuator is set to 50 dB, so it's maximum. It's basically filtering out that 5.8 gig um, link. There is no interference. You can kind of see a blip in real time. Um, you would see it kind of floating across the screen. And by the way, we do have a lot of resources on our website, um, including links to videos that we have posted um, that show this, this lab testing. So these are screenshots and captures. You can actually see the actual signal in real time. Um, so I recommend that if you, if you guys are interested in more information. So this shows you basically um, interference is basically zero. It's there, but it's not doing anything. What we're checking in the, in the, the, the configuration craft tool is RSL, signal to noise ratio, bit error rate, um, and then error seconds in SES. So everything's clean, no issue. Next step, we basically reduce the attenuator down. And so now the interference signal, it has some amplitude. And here you can basically see, in a spectrum analyzer, you would actually see it. So this is a case where you would, if you had a spectrum analyzer on site and you were monitoring this, you would see some, some rise in level, uh, signal level there. But again, the radio for performance wise is not picking up any issues. RSL, bit rate, everything is still good. You're still operating at 256 QAM. And this is by the way, an NACM uh, link. If we go further, and at this point, basically we've um, reduced the attenuator a little bit more. So the signal is greater and you can see one, the, the curve, the power is more uh, noticeable, it's evident. And we have started seeing a drop in signal to noise ratio. There's a little bit of errors on the path as well. Um, and this is where, again, your RSL is working, your modulation is still at the maximum, your bit error rate is good. So your link is, is, is still working, but there's definitely some issue uh, brewing on the path. And then if we keep going at 33, um, the link has basically downshifted just to overcome the noise. Your RSL is increased because now the power from the unlicensed signal um, is causing the RSL on, on the path to increase as well. So it could be a, a misdirection if you look at just RSL individually. Um, output, output power is maxed because of the drop off in modulation, the downshift, and you have e, ES and SES. So the path is uh, taking a lot of errors. And then if we keep going at 18, um, you've downshifted again. There's additional error seconds on the path. Your SNR um, has dropped and you have bit error rate. Your output power is now maxed um, and your RSL keeps increasing because now um, the magnitudes are basically combining and that's your signal level. So let's keep going. At eight, you can see it. The link is now going in and out of lock. You've basically downshifted to QPSK. Um, your minimum modulation level, your throughput has gone down significantly. You've already dropped your non-critical traffic that um, you had probably set to ACM. And now this link is in trouble. And at the next, I guess at the next, uh, next step, your, your link is done. You can't do any more. So this shows you if you did, if you had a spectrum analyzer at every site or a way to basically monitor and expecting it, this would be the alternative. But as you can see, and you probably saw with some of the radio data, sometimes it can be a little misleading and you could have interference on the path, but you just wouldn't know it until it's too late. So this is where we, the uh, FAS comes in. 
in all of these cases, um, FAS was registering alarm activity. So we were seeing status change accordingly um, on that site. Now, the second part of this, um, we did a field test um, back in June, and we were working in conjunction with um, an organization called EPRI, which is a regulation um, standards body uh, in the utility space, well-recognized, um, well-respected. Um, and we were working in collaboration with them and Ameren, which is a utility in the Midwest, um, to basically do some field testing on an actual link that Ameren has. So Ameren, um, their configuration at some um, for their network is a, a pseudo frequency diversity configuration. They basically have a 5.8 gig and a six gig uh, radio in parallel. It's the it's single radio over a common antenna. So what we were able to do was uh, transfer traffic over across um, an alternate route, set up this link and then test interference across that 5.8 gig band. So you can see the configuration. We had IRU uh, 600 radios in the path, uh, 30 meg channels, eight, uh, eight foot antennas, uh, 18 and a half mile path. Um, by the way, when we went out and actually started the testing, we realized that the data, site data, was completely off uh, from the ULS data. Um, one site was at least several thousand feet away, so it, it was an issue. Um, and then we used a similar setup. We used a 5.8 gig radio. Um, test equipment uh, was basically um, the same as what we had in the lab. And we basically drove the path um, back and forth and tested at various points. So this testing, I have a quick summary here, but we have a, a webinar scheduled for next week um, where we will basically go into a deep dive of this field test. Our engineering team, EPRI and Ameren, will basically co-host that webinar. So if you haven't seen any emails from us, um, let us know. If you are interested, let us know as well and we can send you the invite. Uh, that will go through this in more detail. So this is your official sneak peek. Um, members exclusive uh, view of it. So we basically did some testing across this link. This shows you the path. And now uh, one of the things that um, will occur with the, with the AFC is you will be given different, prop you, will, you will be given different uh, parameters to operate in depending on where you are relative to the site. So based on distance, zero to 300 meters, 300 to one kilometer beyond and so on, you basically, there are different propagation models that the AFC will uh, deploy just to make sure that if you're right next to the site versus if you're, you know, five kilometers away, that they can account for free space loss and all the, the issues accordingly. So they're basically, they're different um, models based on the distance. And so what we did, you can, it's hard to see in this, but all of these points basically are locations where we tested unlicensed equipment back to this Newton site. Um, so it, to kind of go through it, we drove around, we pointed the dish um, at each of the sites. We basically tried to um, measure the interference issue. We saw basically um, in, uh, in cases where we had a spectrum analyzer, the same curves that I showed previously. And then we took the data back and then um, checked it against the FAS. And so this table, um, not meant to be uh, something to, that I would expect you guys to read, but it basically shows all the data points that we tested, um, how we tested it, what was the configuration, what was the power level. So we tested the interferer at different power levels as well to emulate standard power, low power, and so on. In every case that there was interference, we were seeing, a, um, we were seeing that event register on FAS. So the, this table summarizes it. And if I actually go to the next table, um, it tells you, measuring both the wanted signal, which is this set of um, uh, data or columns, and then the interfere and what was happening. So at test point A, um, all the way down to E, we were basically testing. In every one of these cases where there was interference, we were able to register it um, on FAS. There was one scenario where we did not see interference at all um, because of the distance, power level, and so on. But at every other combination at the site, we basically saw either a level one, level two, either bursty or, or some other type of interference. So it validated a couple things. One is that um, the, the FAS does register interference on a live link, and we were able to confirm that. And that two, that um, in the simplest of forms, if we had unlicensed equipment on the path, it does register interference. Um, and I know the argument about um, the proximity of devices to the site, the power levels, the exclusions. This testing basically um, reaffirms that it's still going to be an issue. 
that even on the path and especially the longer paths where you have an accumulation of errors on the link, it can, it can definitely degrade a signal. So this is a very high level uh, summary of it. Um, again, I, I welcome everybody to attend um, the webinar next week because that will be a really, really deep technical deep dive into, uh, into the analysis. And then the final slide I have is just a, a key takeaway. And it's, it's pretty evident um, that we did see um, impact um, across, across the board. All the different modulation or uh, interference levels that we tested, I think there were a handful that we did not see any issue. Um, but we, we saw issues anywhere from 16 dBm on, on the radio side, on the interfere side, um, and definitely catastrophic when we got above 22, which is basically, it represents your low power and your standard power device classes. Um, and we saw interference on both the side lobe, back, and in the main lobe uh, as well. So this is, again, I mean, there, depending on the situation, there are also some other more expensive ways to address some of this issue. Interference on the side lobe, if you do have a more side lobe friendly uh, antenna, you can address some of that. But we were seeing issues in all the different um, angles of the radio, so you, you are the antenna. So even if you're able to address some of these cases, there are still issues on the back and front lobe, the bore side uh, um, angles as well on the antenna. Okay, we did this testing over about a day. Um, the analysis was again real time. Um, and if we had done this manually, it would have taken several days just to correlate the data, check it, reconfirm it. Um, and then by then the link would have been down or something more worse would have happened. So that is my final slide. I know there's probably a lot of questions. So um, at this time I could open it up for Q&A.